It's Monday, June 19th, 4 p.m. in Washington, D.C. I'm Natasha Sweets, and you're watching RT America. Well, over the weekend, a United States jet shot down a Syrian government warplane just south of Raqqa in the Syrian town of Jadin. The action has resulted in Moscow halting its cooperation with the U.S. military in Syria. We have team coverage covering all of the angles. Alexei Yaroshevsky is live in our Washington newsroom. Emily Sue is in Moscow with the latest. And Alex Mihailovich is also live from Toronto with a more a better perspective. But let's first start with Alexei Yaroshevsky from Washington. Alexei. Well, the downing of the Su-22 uh, jet belonging to the Syrian government was confirmed by both uh, the operation in here in Resolve, the Central Command in Syria, as well as Damascus, but the versions are clearly different. Now, the U.S. military claims that uh, the jet was downed in an attempted attack on the SDF, the Syrian Democratic Forces, troops in the area, and that's when uh, the F-18 Hornet had to uh, fire on the Su-22 and take the plane down. Uh, we believe believe that uh, the um, uh, pilot of that jet was catapulted and unconfirmed reports from the ground suggest that he is actually alive and may be held by the SDF forces. But then again, it's, uh, uh, those reports cannot be verified for the moment. Now, the Syrian side is saying that um, it vehemently denies any claims that the Syrian jet was trying to attack uh, the pro-coalition forces in, um, around the, um, um, the town of Jadin, which is very close to the de facto capital of Raqqa. Uh, the de facto capital of ISIS of city of Raqqa in northern Syria. Uh, the Syrian army says that, in fact, the jet was performing military operations on ISIS positions. Uh, but then again, it's, uh, you know, the usual war of words. It's really hard to tell who is actually telling the truth here. The bottom line is, is that it's not the first time that this happens. It's not the first time that the U.S. military or the allied uh, military is coming to a head against the um, Syrian government forces. We, of course, remember September last year when 60 um, Syrian army um, military men were killed as a, as an air, after an airstrike in Deir Ezzor, uh, as well as, uh, of course, President Donald Trump's decision on uh, in early April this year to uh, fire uh, the um, Tomahawk missiles on a Syrian air base. And, of course, uh, in the space of the last uh, five weeks or so, there had been three incidents in uh, the south of Syria, uh, in the Al Tanf province, where uh, the U.S. coalition conducted airstrikes on militias allied with the Syrian government, but not the Syrian army itself. And every single time they said the same thing, that it was self-defense, fearing that those militias uh, were threatening the partners and the uh, military of uh, the U.S. allied forces in uh, the region. Uh, however, this time as well, it's the first uh, such instance where uh, you know, this incident happened outside the so-called deconfliction zone. This is something that both Moscow and a lot of diplomats from across the world have been saying is probably the only way to lead Syria out of the military crisis, but so far it hasn't really worked. And it seems things are really escalating, especially considering uh, a somewhat a tough response coming from Moscow on the downing of the Syrian army jet. All right. Thanks so much, Alexei. Well, as you just heard, the U.S.-led coalition in Syria downed a Syrian army jet on Sunday, just south of de facto capital of the Islamic State, the city of Raqqa. Well, Russia's defense ministry says it has halted cooperation with the U.S. military in Syria. Let's continue our team coverage with RT's Emily Sue from Moscow. Now, one thing is when diplomats engage in a war of words, but today's development shows that it's gone far beyond that, with Russia deciding to end the single most important agreement that the U.S. and Russia has signed since Moscow was invited by the Assad regime to join the fight in Syria. Now, this agreement we're talking about here, it was signed back in October 2015, and what it does is it establishes a communication channel between U.S. and Russia forces operating in the airspace over Syria to prevent any sort of unwanted incidents. Now, as you can imagine, this airspace is very dense with so many different countries, so many different groups involved and any sort of mistake and misinformation really can lead to unthinkable consequences. And in this case of the Syrian jet being shot down, well, according to the Russian military, the U.S. has not informed Russia of the decision to shoot down the Syrian jet through the existing communication channel. And at the same time, Russian jets was also operating in the area. And as a result of this incident, Russia has decided to halt all cooperation with the U.S. military in Syria. And this sort of military information blackout can potentially be a disaster waiting to happen. Here's why. Any aircraft belonging to the U.S.-led coalition, detected in the skies west of the Euphrates River, where the Russian Air Force is operating, 
will be tracked as targets by Russian air defense systems. Now, on the Pentagon's part, they've insisted shooting down the Syrian jet was an act of self-defense. They say the Syrian jet were dropping bombs uh, on SDF, the Syrian Democratic Forces positions near Raqqa. Uh, Syria says no. They say that the Syrian jet were targeting ISIL targets near Raqqa. Raqqa is, of course, the capital of Islamic State's self-proclaimed caliphate. And Russia has described this as an act of aggression. They've described this as a violation of not only of Syria's sovereignty, but also of international law. Uh, Russia Foreign Minister Sergei Lavrov He's also commented on this before the statement was released by the Russian military. We call on the United States and all others who have their forces or advisors on the ground in Syria to ensure the coordination of our work. Zones of de-escalation are one of the possible options to move forward jointly. We call on everyone to avoid unilateral moves, respect Syrian sovereignty, and join our common work, which is agreed with the Syrian government. While well, the U.S. is heating up the battle in Syria, a key ally says it will not be entering the fight against ISIS in that country. Let's continue our team coverage from Toronto, where RT's Alex Mihailovic is live with the latest from Toronto. Alex. Yeah, so the Canadian government has made it very clear that there's a big no when it comes to any action in Syria. Our Defence Minister Harjit Sarjan, or Sajan has uh, said this is days ago, prior to any of this going down now with the Syrian jet, uh, that Canada has no interest in entering the Syria arena. We did sign an agreement back in March that extended our anti-ISIS fight for three months, which would end now at the very end of June. Uh, this was mostly focused on Iraq and the city of Mosul. Seoul, Canada has officially 200 special operation troops helping out Kurds, etc., in that area, as well as medical and other divisions that are helping the Iraq army. Uh, we do have special surveillance planes as well as refueling planes that have done actions over the Syrian territory that have helped other NATO allies, such as the U.S., with refueling planes, obviously, and with logistics on the ground and what's going on. But when it comes to that right now, because of what we saw happen here with the Syrian plane being downed, that things have possibly changed with the Canadian stance in that front as well. The government is staying very silent at the moment, knowing very well that our planes are doing exactly what I just said, helping with surveillance and with refueling, and uh, thinking that they might be targets for any type of Russian anti-defense, simply because that has, has been what has been said because of what has happened with the U.S. on the ground. So uh, when we're talking about Canada and its role in Syria, the role is not going to be changing. Canada will not be entering the Syrian arena in any bigger capacity than it already has. And there is the possibility that it might be even pulling out. Diplomacy is diplomacy. You're not going to hear too much at this point. And obviously, they're going to be walking uh, very quietly with the Canadian government, uh, not trying to offend anybody. But at the same time, the Canadian defense, national defense, wants to take care of our own troops and our own pilots and make sure that nobody is harmed. All right. Thanks so much, Alex Mihailovic from Toronto. Thanks for that live report. Now we turn to Gareth Porter, historian, investigative journalist, and national security policy analyst. Thank you so much for joining us today. And uh, so first we want to talk about, you know, the Russian deputy foreign minister has come out and said the U.S.-led coalition attack on the Syrian government is an act of aggression, possibly a breach of international law. And they've come out further to say that the U.S., is trying to defeat ISIS, but actually help them, that this was a counter-terrorism uh, policy. What are your thoughts? Do you agree? Well, there are some serious problems, clearly, with the U.S. posture in the Syrian conflict at this point. It's not only the Russians who have raised questions about the legitimacy and the wisdom of the U.S. Uh, assertion of its power in this conflict as far as it's gone and as, as, uh, as rapidly as it's gone. If you go back now a few weeks, the interesting thing to me is that the U.S. military in Syria seemed very confident that they could assert the right to have exclusive access to this zone around Raqqa uh, to the exclusion of any Russian or Syrian or allied forces. Uh, in that in that conflict, they were wrong. Of course, um, the the Syrians were already, with the support of the Russians and the Iranians, were working with the Turks to establish a zone of deconfliction, in which they could uh, shift their forces toward the Raqqa uh, part of the of the uh, national conflict, the conflict in Syria, and that's exactly what they've been doing. They have 
uh, shifted ground troops and the Russians have shifted their air power toward the Raqqa front for the last several weeks. So the U.S. made a fundamental miscalculation here that they could essentially uh, threaten the, the Russians uh, and the Syrians with uh, a response militarily and that they would stay away from that front and allow the United States and its uh, uh, Kurdish and Arab allies in that region to go ahead and complete what they hope is the, uh, the conquest of Raqqa, the, the recapture of Raqqa so from ISIS. Do you think the U.S. was trying to threaten not just Syria, but Russia as well in that act? Well, there's no doubt that that was the intention. They expected the Russians would stay away, that they would recognize a unilateral, uh, what they call a deconfliction, the U.S. called a deconfliction zone in uh, eastern Syria from Raqqa south uh, around the Euphrates River. Now, the, the Russians are saying quite explicitly now, no, we never agreed to that. That was your unilateral demand, and we never accepted it. And they are now saying, if you stray to the west of the Euphrates, we will shoot down your fighter planes. So you don't think more de-escalation zones will possibly help in this matter? Well, we do have to have a de-escalation zone, but it has to be negotiated between the United States and Russia. There's no question about that. And at this point, the problem is that the Trump administration and the Pentagon have appear, appear to be taking the posture that we don't need to negotiate with the Russians at this point. Now, I think they're wrong. They're going to have to change that position. And that is precisely what I think uh, Foreign Minister Lavrov is saying. At well, this initially point. they wanted to, and then now they're getting so much backlash from, you know, politics as usual in Washington that they can't even negotiate with Russia. Which, and in fact, before he came into office, President Trump said that he certainly wanted to, you know, better relations. Well, there is a problem politically. I think you're right that the political atmosphere in Washington and in the United States generally has shifted so far to the whatever you want to call it, hysteria, hysteria about uh, any contact with the Russians, that there is much greater reluctance now on the part of the White House to do that. But I think he's going to have to overcome that. I, I think we are now uh, at the most dangerous point in confrontation between the United States and uh, the former Soviet Union or Russia since the Cuban Missile Crisis. There's been nothing like this since the Cuban Missile Crisis, and that's why there must be really a very sharp uh, reconsideration of U.S. policy in Syria. And, and we know that um, you know, the U.S., whether it's President Obama or now President Trump, um, haven't really gotten along with Bashar al-Assad. Um, do you think the U.S. wants to take down Bashar al-Assad, or do you think that there's still a chance to kind of reconcile those ties? Well, I, I think a couple of things are relevant here. First of all, we know that Trump came to office with the intention of not participating in a regime change policy. He made that very clear. Mm -hmm. He was induced to shift his policy by, we don't really understand why, uh, at the point of, of the Khan Shekun alleged uh, chemical weapons attack, um, and then immediately made a decision to carry out the tomahawk strike against the Russian base in, uh, in Syria. Now, uh, he's still taking that line publicly, but uh, certainly there is very strong reason to reconsider this in light of, of the consequences of, of really pushing that too far under the present circumstances. So mm -hmm. I think it's a very fluid situation at this moment. And uh, uh, again, I think it's, it's really incumbent on the White House to, to reconsider its options in light of the fact that they really made what appears to me at least to be a very fundamental uh, miscalculation. I see. And, and we heard from our reporter Alex over in Canada about the decision to not bring troops into Syria, Canadian troops. What are your thoughts on that? Well, I think it's quite understandable for any uh, state which is not uh, out to intentionally pick a fight with the Russians, that they're not eager to get involved in this uh, situation in Syria. It reminds me a bit of uh, what happened in Afghanistan some years ago, back in 2004, 2005, when the U.S. was trying to pull in NATO countries, other NATO countries, to take over much of the responsibility for opposing the Taliban. And those NATO countries were willing to do it on the assumption that it wouldn't really involve much, if any, combat at all. They were quite wrong about that. The U.S., uh, of course, underestimated the degree to which there was a danger of that. And then I think a number of NATO countries got caught up in a war that they really hadn't anticipated. 
So the U.S. basically, you think, needs to take a step back and kind of recalculate the situation? I hope that will be the case. I can't guarantee it, that's for sure. I see. All right. Thank you so much for your time. Really appreciate it. That's Gareth Porter, historian, investigative journalist, and national security policy analyst. We really appreciate his time.